Hi everybody, welcome back, glad you could tune in again. So we've reached the halfway point in the book of Colossians, we're in chapter 3. I'm going to read the first few verses of this and then we'll uh, make some observations about it which may help you to get into it and explore some of the details in it. Here's how it goes, chapter 3, verse 1. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Okay, so let's just uh, step back a moment or two and I'll just make a couple of introductory comments about the place of this part of the book of Colossians in the letter as a whole and the internal logic of these four verses. First, the book of Colossians, perhaps more clearly than any other of Paul's letters, with the possible exception of Romans and Ephesians, is divided into two very clear and well-defined halves. The first half, uh, broadly speaking, covers what you might call doctrinal matters, whereas the second half covers more ethical or practical matters. Now, obviously, um, that distinction is somewhat artificial. The second half of this letter is full of doctrinal matters and there are ethical things going on in the first half. But you can see the balance shifting uh, and you get it in um, Romans, uh, the beginning of Romans 12, you get it in Ephesians, beginning of uh, Ephesians 4. And here what you're starting to see is how the supremacy of Christ as the king of all things, the lord of all things, the one who is enthroned the firstborn from among the dead, the firstborn of all creation, how his identity as the one in whom all fullness and life is found should be worked out practically. And that makes sense of the first verse that you see here. Here's how you've come to the end of uh, chapter 2, you begin chapter 3. If then you have been raised with Christ, and here's the ethical or moral imperative, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Now, what will it mean to seek the things that are above? Well, the specifics will be worked out in verses 5 and following, and there's lots of specifics there. But let me make uh, an observation about the detail of the logic of these few verses, because there's a couple of potential misunderstandings that might go on here. Just notice verse 1. Seek the things that are above where Christ is. Verse 2. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Now, this could easily be misunderstood as though it's inculcating a kind of heavenly versus earthly dichotomy. The misunderstanding will go something like this. The physical things of this world, the things that are going on around us, even the practical things in our day-to-day -day lives, our work, our families, everything like that, that doesn't really matter. What matters is that we close our minds and fix our hearts on the things that are above. This could be misunderstood as a call to a kind of pure meditative or pure contemplative form of Christian faith, where what we're really supposed to do is turn our backs on all this physical stuff around us, all the commitments that are involved in being children, being husbands and wives, being workers in the world, being engaged in relationships, in families and so on, turn our backs on all those things and simply contemplate the divine. Fix your minds on things that are above not on earthly things. Can you see how that misunderstanding could take place? Now that is a fundamentally misplaced misunderstanding of the text. Paul's dichotomy here is not between unworldly, unearthly things that are in heaven, non-physical things that are in heaven, and the physical things of the earth, as though the former are good and the latter are to be avoided. His contrast is fundamentally an ethical one. It's certainly not a physical versus non-physical thing. After all, he says, fix your minds on things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And Christ is physical. Christ is still embodied. Christ is resurrected humanity. And so this can't be a physical versus non-physical thing. But more profoundly and more fundamentally, what's going on here is Paul is contrasting the purity and the goodness and the wisdom and the truthfulness of Christ with the impurity and foolishness and evil and corruption 
of a fallen, sinful world. The contrast then is not between heaven as, a, as an immaterial place and the world as a material place, but Christ in whom is found goodness and truth and the world, the fallen world, where sin and misery and evil are found. It's an ethical contrast. And so what we're to do is, as the author of Hebrews would put it, fix your minds on Jesus so that our conduct in the world will be shaped by him. It's not that the world is to be avoided or the world is to be ignored or the world is to be eschewed so that we just fix our minds and embrace a contemplative form of Christian religion. No, it's that the world is to be engaged with, but Christianly. As those whose minds and hearts and therefore lives are shaped by the Lord Jesus Christ. And you see the proof of that in what follows in verse 5 and following, where it is deeply practical stuff that Paul is interested in. He doesn't there append a contemplation and meditation manual. Not that there's anything wrong with times of contemplation in prayer and so on. But what he appends is a deeply practical series of guidelines for how fixing our minds on the risen, embodied, enthroned Lord Jesus Christ, who is supreme over all things, should be worked out practically in our day-to-day -day lives. And I invite you, we'll look at this in future videos, but just skim down verses 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. You find all this gritty, practical, uh, Christian, moral teaching. Uh, put to death whatever is earthly and use sexual immorality and so on. And then put on, verse 12, humility, meekness, patience, kindness, bearing with one another in love. These are deeply practical things. And so to summarise all that, we're not to embrace a kind of heaven and earth dichotomy as though heavenly non-physical things are good and the physical stuff around us is to be avoided. It's rather a good versus evil dichotomy where the paradigm of goodness is the physical ascended Christ who is now in heaven on whom we're to fix our minds so that we can live now in this world as those who are transformed by him. And it's that final point, those who are transformed by him, that we should also take note of. Just look closely at verse 1 and what it seems to say, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. And the question arises, what precisely is the content of that if? Is it if you have, oh, and probably you haven't, or is it if you have and certainly you have? Can you see the difference? Is Paul trying to raise doubts in his readers' minds about whether they've really been raised with Christ and saying, well, only those who are really sure have been raised in Christ should fix their minds on things above? Or is it more of a rhetorical way of saying, since then you've been raised with Christ, fix your minds on things that are above. In fact, some English translations translate this particular form of a conditional clause as since. I think the international version does that. And I think there's some justification for that because of what the text goes on to say in verse three. Notice what Paul says. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. No question there about our status. Paul is not wanting to say, you know, there may be some super spiritual Christians among you who are able to fix your minds on things above because you've been raised with Christ, but the rest of us are just stuck here on earth and we're, our minds are polluted by many things. No, Paul has a far more optimistic vision of the transformation that has already taken place in us. And this optimistic vision is what I want to leave you with today. Paul is convinced, because the scriptures teach from beginning to end, that the transforming power of Christ really is transforming power. You have been raised with, with Christ. You've been baptised into his death. You're one with him in his death. Romans 6, you've been raised with him. Sin has no dominion over you. Sin has no rights over you. There's no good reason to carry on living like the rest of the world. So you've been raised with Christ. Fix your minds on things above because you've died with him. And one day, what we know now by faith we will see after the resurrection when we see his face, verse 4. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So it's that future hope, that certainty of appearing with Christ in glory that is to animate our lives now as we fix our minds on him and commit ourselves to be shaped in our living in the world, not 
by the values of the fallen, sinful world around us, but by him who is enthroned in heaven. So much for verses 1 to 4. In the next devotion, we'll get into some of the details of verses 5 and following all the way through the rest of these two chapters. But that'll do us for now. The Lord bless you, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Bye for now.